All right, welcome back. Uh, we're going to continue on our, our journey, our, our sojourn through 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 11. Last, last week we talked about uh, verses uh, 16 through 21, and we kind of highlighted uh, Paul's justification for his boasting, and we highlighted the fact that it's really not boasting in ourselves. It's not a fleshly boasting that Paul is talking about, but it was more of a, a justification of his credentials uh, through Jesus Christ while they were willing to accept uh, justification from people who are far less qualified. And we're going to kind of move onward, but in this passage of Scripture, we're going to be going through uh, chapter 11, verses 22 through 33. Um, we're going to keep in mind those things that we covered last week, the reasons that Paul thought that boasting in his own qualifications was important. If the Corinthians, who probably judged themselves wiser than they actually were, and let me just say with that, that, that um, Matthew Henry made this comment uh, in his commentary, that that's kind of a, hum that's kind of a sign of the human condition. I, I, I will be honest and say that there's been times in my life when I probably accounted myself as being a lot wiser than I actually was. And I think that probably wisdom comes in understanding that we're not that wise. Apart, especially apart from God. So if the Corinthians, who they probably judged themselves wiser than they actually were, would tolerate the boasting from teachers who were false teachers and disciples, and some that had claimed to be apostles, who were certainly at that point false apostles, um, they should listen to the boasting of a two, true apostle of Jesus Christ. That's what Paul is really saying to them. Now we'll take a look at an accounting of his own qualifications. This might be a little bit longer than our last uh, visit, but I think it's important to take this passage of Scripture in, it, in its whole. So uh, we'll start uh, reading uh, chapter 11, and we'll start with verse, uh, verse 22, and he says, Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequently, in deaths often. And he's kind of laying out here uh, what the specifics of his experience are. This is his curriculum vitae, so to speak. From the, from the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one. The law said that they could be... Uh, during flogging would get would be flogged 40 times and what they would do is they would as a as a gift they would uh bring it back so the minus one and i'm not sure how much of a gift that is uh three times i was beaten with rods once i was stoned three times i was shipwrecked a night and a day i have been in the deep uh, a lot of commentators uh feel that that's a reference uh to him being in a, thrown in a dungeon at some point in journeys, often in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, that's a lot of perils, in weariness and toil, in sleeplessness, often in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, besides the other things that what come upon me daily. So he's like, I've experienced these aside from what I deal with on a daily basis. Uh, my deep concern for all the churches, who is weak and I am not weak? Who is made to stumble and I do not burn with indignation? If I must boast, <coughs> I will boast in the things which concern my infirmity. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is blessed forever, knows that I am not lying. In Damascus, the governor under Aretas, the king, was guarding the city of Damascenes with a garrison desiring to arrest me. But I was let down in a basket through a window in the wall and escaped from his hands. Kind of tells us the impact that Paul might have been having or that he was a, they were afraid he would have if there was an entire garrison waiting to arrest Paul. We see in this scripture, in this passage of scripture, it is kind of long, what Paul is kind of uh, laying out. We see, we start off with where he says, uh, uh, 
Are the Hebrews? So am I. Are the Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers? So what we're seeing is that Paul mentions the state of his birth. The word used in the New King James Version says privileges of his birth. But that word seems to have different meaning today than it did, and I'm not sure that it really captures it. But there were certain privileges or rights he had at his, at his, as his birth. It was kind of interesting because he was a Roman citizen, but he was also a Hebrew's Hebrew, which kind of puts Paul in a unique situation. I can't think of another prominent biblical character that could have had the apostolic call to, to preach to the Gentiles. It, Paul was uniquely qualified. As we talked about before, he was educated in the law. He was, he was probably at one point in his life a Pharisee and a member of the Sanhedrin likely, but he was educated by one of the most prominent uh, rabbis in the history of Israel, which was uh, Gamaliel. So he, had a un he was uniquely placed for his ministry. Uh, the benefits of his birth were like anything that the Corinthians would aspire to. He said he was a Hebrew of Hebrews. He was from a family from among the Jews that never intermarried with the Gentiles. And at that time, that was a, a prominent thing. That seems nonsense to us. But at the time, it was following uh, commandments of God or recommendations from God. He was not in the line of proselytes or a person who had to be converted to Judaism from another religion. This word comes from the Greek term that means uh, stranger, this word proselyte, excuse me. <coughs> um, it comes from, from, the, from the word who is a, um, it means stranger or sojourner in the land. He could accurately boast that he was an Israelite that descended from Jacob, who was certainly a beloved uh, patriarch. Um, and was also the seed of Abraham. Some scholars glean from this that the false apostles were on, of the Jewish race, but were also were casting dispersion, uh, dispersion on the Gentile converts. And if we we'll remember, we, there was a discussion in other books if, that you're familiar with where Paul addresses you know, this, the issue of circumcision. Uh, and it kind of kind of boils down into this, but so the false pro apostles were likely Jewish, and they were making the same claims that Paul was making, but putting down the Gentile converts and saying that they couldn't really be Christians or follower of Christ because they didn't come from the the you know the Abrahamic line. Uh, it, that's a complicated thing. We could probably do several classes on that, so I'll leave it where it is at at this point. Then he moves on to his status as an apostle. And there's a couple interesting things at the end of this lesson I'll point out, but uh, you might uh, find it as we go through. <clears throat> he was, as he would claim, to be more than simply an ordinary minister of Christ. God had counted him faithful and had placed him in the ministry. And we know about his calling. He had been a useful minister to the Corinthians, and they had seen the proofs of his ministry. Paul was saying, are they ministers of Christ? I am more so. And again, this is not a fleshly boast. This is him stating his actual qualifications. Then Paul goes on to make the case that he had suffered for Christ. And he makes the point that he was <laughs> gifted with the grace of God that he allowed him to endure sufferings and abundance in his laboring and enduring even imprisonment. Now, I consider myself a pretty tough guy, but I don't think I would ever ask God, you know, give me suffering and the ability to endure it. And that's essentially what, what Paul was gifted with. Paul proved he was an extraordinary minister as well as an extraordinary sufferer. Paul, who was a Jew, was an apostle to the Gentiles and as such was really disliked by the Jews. Let's take a look at his, his relationship. What was his first job? It was the, the priests had kind of enlisted Paul and Paul's job was to kill Christians, to torment and kill Christians trying to put down what they saw as a, as a rebellion. So it makes sense that once Paul's converted and can no longer do the job that the priests of the temple had hired him to do or in, taken him in to do, that they were uh, unhappy with him. He became one of the people that they sent him to, pro to persecute, which probably angered them. There's a certain poetic justice in that to be sure, but the truth is the Gentiles were not a whole lot easier on him than the Jews were. Paul had become accustomed to things that were reserved for the most notorious criminals, but the persecutions of Paul were really for righteousness sake. And Paul knew that. I think that's what 
I can't even imagine his conversations with the Lord, you know, while the suffering is happening. Five times, we'll kind of break it down from what we know from history. Five times fell under the punishment of the Jews. He would be lashed 40 times minus one. That has happened five times that we know of. And that was usually, he would usually get the 40 lashes minus one. And when they whipped him 39 times instead of 40, it was likely that that was the only break that he ever got from them. Then Gentiles had no such moderation uh, with other Gentiles. He was beaten with a rod three times by the Gentiles that we know of. At least one of these happened uh, in Philippi. At least once he was stoned and left for dead. He was shipwrecked three times. He spent some time in a dungeon, and that's why the, the uh, reference to in the deep, day and night in the deep, uh, shows up in 2 Corinthians 11.25, uh, that he was either in a dungeon or otherwise uh, uh, shut up or uh, placed as a prisoner. Pretty much all of his days, he faced some kind of persecution. One scholar noted that it isn't clear if Paul had one whole year in the whole of his ministry where he didn't suffer some kind of physical punishment or imprisonment. Uh, when they look at the timelines, it looks like that never happened, where a whole year went by without some life-threatening uh, thing happening to him. Paul needed God's grace on a daily basis. The Jews, the heathen, the Gentile, all had an interest in hurting him. Because that tells us how important his message was. If he wasn't effective, they wouldn't care. He's effective, and he upset people. So maybe we need to keep in mind when... When we feel that resistance from the devil, and maybe that's a good sign that we're, you know, we're keeping it between the buoys and we're doing what we're supposed to be doing. And if we're going through life with no resistance at all, maybe we need to look at the effectiveness of our ministries, our personal ministry. So Paul needed God's grace. They all had something against him because he was being effective. Wherever he went and however he traveled overland or by boat, there were those who would want to do him harm and some wanted to hurt him. And some of those people that wanted to hurt him had the gall to call themselves his brethren. Ultimately, I mean, this is the truth is that ultimately we'll all be held accountable for our actions and those that harm ministers of God, God and his true disciples. And we'll have to explain our actions if anybody, any of us would seek to harm people. Paul, his, Paul and his ministry and writings are a huge gift to the world, and he was a blessing to us all in his lifetime. But Matthew Henry <laughs> made an interesting comment, and actually it might have been Leonard Ravenhill. I'm, I'm, I might be getting uh, crossed over in my, in my notes, but I, he said that he was a blessing to all of us in his lifetime, but was a plague to his own generation in his lifetime. And that tells us something about the effectiveness of his ministry. We can see some important things in the life of Paul. There was not uh, a weak Christian that he didn't sympathize with. There wasn't anyone who was scandalized that Paul didn't regard as a child of God. We need to understand that, um, and I've <clears throat> come to feel this more and more strongly as, as I think, think about it and pray about it over time, is that even the people that are, are the most depraved going the wrongest uh, most possible destructive direction are still children of God and our obligation to pray for them does not cease regardless of how their life is we need to pray for them we may not be the one that that uh, even plants the seed or, or harvest but we need to be watering the ground we need to be tending the ground constantly regardless and that is the way we need to work together to to establish you know to work for the kingdom so we see that we have little reason to be enamored or full out in, in love with the pomp of this world and that's really kind of what we're seeing in this story of paul is that <clears throat> we might have thought of him a little differently if he stayed in the nicest hotel flew around in the nicest jets drove the nicest car uh, uh, traveled by yacht. But Paul says that any suffering for righteous sake will be credited to our honor. And so as we're moving forward, we need to maybe look at suffering a little differently. Not having Wi-Fi is probably not suffering. Um, 
You go to Starbucks and they're out of the caramel macchiatos, that's probably not suffering. But we might need to take a look at what suffering really means. And we may face that in the future. We may have to evaluate what suffering is and what is going to be necessary if we are actually called to suffer for the cause of Christ. I want to make two more quick points. Paul seems to mention something out of order. The danger was in Damascus, soon after his conversion, he had settled into Christian life. When we see in Acts 9, 25, uh, 24 and 25, he says, But their plot became known to Saul, and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. So this is really even before he, he ministered. Then his disciples took him by night and let him down through the wall in a large basket. Again, he mentioned that in the last passage of Scripture that he had to escape uh, being lowered down in a basket. The second interesting thing that we see is that through this whole discourse at the last, in the last few chapters is Paul, in, he never in his line of defense, mentions the Damascus Road experience or mentions it specifically. And I find it curious that Paul, in justifying himself, justifying himself in quotes, or boasting, never brings up this encounter with Jesus that made him what they called an apostle out of time. At the, t at the time, <clears throat> and, tr and tradition would tell us that in order to, to be an apostle, one had to be a witness to, to the events of Jesus' life. Uh, certainly the death, burial, and resurrection. And we, Paul probably actually was, but he was never commissioned face-to-face -face uh, before Jesus' crucifixion for ministry. So we know about the Damascus Road experience and how, you know, he was struck blind and, and Jesus said to him on the road, why do you persecute me? Um, which would probably reset your vision or turn you around. But that's, it's a really seminal thing that happened to Paul, but we, he doesn't really go back and explain that when he's in his defense. He doesn't say, look, I had an experience where I was face to face with, with Christ and he, he told me to reach the Gentiles. He never... That was, we would say in our parlance today, or probably that um, that was a card he didn't play, and I find that interesting. So he never brings up that encounter, and he was considered what they call an apostle out of time because he, he was really uh, called out of it. And there was you know, interesting historical back and forth between the, uh, the, uh, the apostles who, some of them were disciples of Peter and, and his relationship with Paul and and James thing of that nature. That's a completely different topic of, for another time. But I find it interesting that he had this face-to-face -face meeting and, and it didn't really, uh, he never brings it out. And I wonder, I, I'm curious as to why that is. So next time we'll talk about, uh, Paul has a vision of paradise. And then he will talk a little bit about what became known as a thorn in his flesh. And people have been speculating for centuries about what that is. Uh, I don't think we'll ever know. I don't know that we need to, but we'll, we'll continue in that. But let's just close in a quick, uh, quick word of prayer. Father God, I pray for everyone who's listening and everyone uh, who's a member of this body and the body of Christ. Lord, I uh, pray that your, that your grace and your peace would, would flow over everyone, that we would uh, keep our eyes on you and keep our eyes on the gospel, Lord, that we would understand that it was that you came to, to reconcile us with uh, your Father and that through you our sins can be saved and that we would have eternal life. And that's the gospel. That's the reason we, we study and we pray and we live is to, to be reconciled and, and live eternally with you. And we ask for your blessing and keeping in your name. Amen.